Greetings and salutations, and welcome to this episode of Playwright Spotlight. Before we begin, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below telling us what your favorite play or who your favorite playwright is, or even a comment just to say hi, because apparently it affects our algorithm and helps us out. Uh, also, be sure to share this video with a playwriting friend. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, be sure to subscribe to the channel and leave a five-star review. My guest today is a playwright, actor, and filmmaker based in Georgia. Many of his short plays have been produced in theaters around the world, and most notably, he was a semifinalist in the 37th Annual Samuel French Off-Broadway Festival in New York with his post-apocalyptic play, Lobster Man. His play, Insurgents, was also a semifinalist in the 2020 Screencraft Stage Play Contest. He is a five-time recipient of the Porter Fleming Literary Award in the playwriting category, and some of his works have been published in anthologies by Smith & Krause. He is also the host and producer of the radio theater podcast Gathered by the Ghost Light, a collection of stage plays adapted to an audio-only format. format. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Jonathan Cook. Hey, how's it playwright going? Spotlight, sir. Um, well, thanks. Thanks for coming in. Um, me. This is our first time meeting. We've had a little bit of exchanges on on Facebook Messenger. I mm -hmm. saw your play, Memento Mori, at what, if I remember correctly, it was kind of like the south by southwest of of play of one acts or plays or something like that. I'm I'm trying to remember the exact festival. It was very unique. It's in West Hollywood. Do you, was, did uh, you uh, get to Sporting. attend? Yes, it was in 2019, three years ago. It was the Short and Sweet Festival, the Hollywood. That's what it's the Short and Sweet South Festival by, worldwide. Yeah. Um, and sure, South by Southwest, Short and Sweet. Yeah, one and the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell me, tell me about this festival. This is a great resource for other playwrights. Uh, this is one thing that we haven't talked about yet. So um, what was your experience with this? How did you come about it? How did you submit? What was the process from being a playwright? The Short and Sweet Festival, um, it's pretty cool because they're, they're kind of spread out across the world. So if you're uh, so you submit your play, and then what they do is they send it out to all of the different festivals that are connected with the Short and Sweet Festival in like Dubai, Australia, um, India, um, and Hollywood, which is where uh, Memento Mori was. Um, I think Memento Mori was probably the third time I submitted to Short and Sweet. They had originally done uh, my play Transferring Kyle, which that one wasn't done. I don't think they were doing Hollywood at the time, but that one was done in the Australia edition and... India and I think the Philippines. Um, and then after that, the next year I submitted a play called Don't Call Me Cupid, which again, that kind of made it made its rounds in the Short and Sweet Festival. And then the third time I did Memento Mori and that made its rounds in the Hollywood version, which uh, I think that's the only USA based festival they have. So that was the only one that I've been able to see just because international travel just gets kind of expensive. <laughs> so. Sure. But yeah, yeah that was um, my, it was a good, okay. a good experience. So you're not limited, like from a playwriting perspective, you're not limited to, oh, you have to be regional. You, you know, you don't have to, you can submit to Australia or Dubai. And if you can't make it, you can't make it. But, you know, if you've got a, a good enough piece that you can be, you're in. Yeah. I mean, I'll submit anywhere in the world that's willing to produce plays. Uh, I mean, it's awesome to go get to see your play performed. Um, but I've even had I've had plenty of USA productions that I haven't been able to attend just because of scheduling and again cost of travel. Sure. Yeah, it just it adds up. Well, you just mentioned that you'll submit any time, any to any time, anywhere to anything. Um, can you expand on that? Can you? Can, what What are your criteria? Is there anything that you like you look for specifically that you're like mm, no or like you know is it um, is there a return you look for? What specifics can you, you know, what, what well, do you, how do you judge I've, your submissions? I've submitted plenty of plays at theaters that, you know, if it gets accepted, it gets performed, but you don't exactly get paid. You know, your reward is, you know, your play is getting performed. And I don't, I, you know, I don't mind doing that at the level of playwriting that I'm at. I don't, you know, I'm not super professional, publish all over the place or anything. So I don't mind getting my short works out there like that. Um, but it's always great when theaters do accept it and they do give you a little stipend. Um, I guess one thing I do kind of, I'm not gonna say I stay away from it, but if a play festival has, you know, submission fees involved, 
Um, I'll always research the festival. Um, if it's a super high price, I won't even worry about it. If it's if they're charging a fee, but they're in this really small town where I don't think many people at all will see it, I'll, I'll kind of gauge it and see if it's worth you know paying the fee. Um, but then there's been some, you know, the short and sweet festival, they have a small fee. It's not much. I think it's about 10 bucks, but they, like I said, their festivals are all over the world and, you know, there's potential for a lot of people to see your work. So I don't know. I just kind of take it case by case basis on that kind of thing. What constitutes a high fee for to, in your mind? Uh, usually anything more than around 10 bucks or so. And okay. even with that, you know, I, I would hope that if you did get accepted, that they would be reimbursing you in some way, whether it be uh, monetary or, or some type of award or something. I'm not sure. You, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of be, because of your other um, interests for lack of a better word, I'm going to inquire to you about this. So um, this doesn't necessarily apply to playwriting, but it does kind of, um, it cor- it corresponds. Uh, that's not probably the best word. But so, from a playwriting perspective, I've heard of a lot of things. Ah, oh, you know, I'm not going to submit if I have to pay a fee because it's you know writing on the the backs of playwrights. But at the same time, you look at a film festival where you're looking at maybe I don't I don't submit screenplays to film festivals yet. So I have no experience in this. You might have the experience in this. So some of those may charge $25, $35. So where does that line get drawn but, you know, between, oh, I'll submit my screenplay for $35 to be read at a film festival where it's not going to be performed, but you're being charged a submission fee for your play to hopefully be performed. So you're getting something out of it. You're getting like maybe what, how one week run, two week run, four week run. Yeah. How can you speak to that? What in, and I don't mean to, you know, kind of like th- throw something at you off, off the cuff, yeah. but this is just yeah. a different entity that we haven't really got to discuss on the playwright sp- uh, spotlight. So I'm just curious what your, what your thoughts yeah. are. Uh, interesting enough. Um, you know, I've written screenplays, but like you, I don't, submit screenplays to like screenwriting competitions. Usually Um, I did do the stagecraft one um, because that what they wanted with that was a, they wanted, they were actually looking for, that was a stage play um, competition. And what they were doing is reading the stage play and see what the potential was to adapt it into a film. Oh, interesting. Uh, that that's how they were judging it when they were, you know, marking their semifinalists and finalists and all that. Um, which I, that was an interesting process. And uh yeah, that, that did have a, a fee involved, but with every step of the way I got feedback on it. And with it being that was one of my first full length plays that I ever wrote. Like uh, historically, I've always been writing short plays. And so when I got my first full length play written, I did get some actors together and we read it and I adjusted it from there. And then I saw this competition come up and I was like, you know what, let me just, let me just see what these so-called professionals might, you know, come back with it as far as it being adapted to a film. Um, But it's funny you say that because I did um, a couple of weeks ago, I made a short film. um, And earlier this week week I was submitting out the film festivals and when, and the fees are, you know, just adding up and it was like, man, I don't do this for my plays. Why am I doing it for for this film? Um, and I, and with films, I guess, and I've talked to playwrights and there's a lot of them. There's adamant. They're like, I will never pay fees to submit my play anywhere. I just won't do it. And then I, I brought up, I was like, you know, but with films, you know, there, there aren't film festivals out there that will accept, that will take the time to watch your stuff without you paying them, paying a fee. Um, and so I, I kind of look at it like that when I'm submitting my plays as well, because I've done a lot of short films. I've submitted them out. I know how that process works. So when I'm doing submitting out plays, like I said, I take it on a case by case. Same thing with films. I'll take it on a case by case basis. If I see uh, a film submission thing posted on like Film Freeway, I always research the festival. I'll look at their sure. Facebook, see how many followers they have. I'll look at their website, see how well made it is. And I'll just kind of look at how many years they've been running. And if they're in their first year, they have like 100 likes on Facebook. I'm just like, eh, I'm going to pass on this one for now until they build up. 
Um, but then other film festivals, you know, they have 20,000 followers and that you could tell it's a huge festival, you know, that might be worth the price of submission. So yeah, sure. same thing with, with films and plays. It's like a case by case basis. You know, I hate paying fees, but sometimes to get your work out there, um, sometimes it'd be worth it. Um, I've been rejected a lot and I've been accepted a lot. So rejections far outweigh the acceptances, but <laughs> that's just how it goes. Well, let's let, well, let's talk about that then. Let's, how do you, how do you deal with rejection? You know, you take it in stride or is like, I don't know what you throw your desk over, you know, flip it over. And say, I don't know why I'm doing this anymore. Gosh, darn it. Why did I even, there's a, uh, in my early days, it, I kind of took it hard. I was like, man, I thought that was really good. Um, but I think what you have to do is, especially with new play exchange out now and a lot of playwrights put their works on. If, if I don't get submitted to a festival, even when I do, I like to read the other plays that were accepted or if mine wasn't accepted, I like to read the other plays that were. And it kind of helps me put things in perspective where I'm just like, you know what? These plays are pretty good. You know, I, I could see why they got accepted and it's not that mine was bad, but maybe the read, you know, it's all subjective. The, the person reading it, you got to speak to them and everyone's different. <laughs> so while my play might get accepted to this festival, while this play didn't, you know, they'll get accepted to another festival that my play didn't. And that's what I love about the new play exchange is because, you know, I get on there a lot and read plays, especially when I see like in the playwriting binge or playwriting group when people say, oh, I got a hit. I'm accepted at this festival. I'll be like, oh, I mean, I kind of want to check this out. You know, maybe this will be one that sure. I want to produce on the podcast or something. Um, but, yeah, so I, I think that helps is if uh, if you don't get accepted, you know, read the plays that did get accepted and just kind of see what you were up against. Um and, and yeah, in my early days, it it, it, it was kind of hard, but I did have a, there was a writing professor at my university who was, uh, he, he did a lot of playwriting as well. And he told me, he goes, you know, you got, you got to have thick skin. He's like, uh, it's the person reading it. You may or may not speak to them, but you know what? Someone else who reads it, you may speak to them, you know? So it's right. all subjective. What's your background in, in playwriting? How did you get your start? Uh, let's see. Well, um, I started out as an actor. I, uh, and I started high school in 1994. I was 14 and I was a really shy, introverted kid. And in middle school, I remember seeing my, my older brother, he used to act in plays in high school. And I used to think that was the coolest thing. And, uh, I, I mean, I'm not outgoing. I, I'm not good with conversation. I, things get awkward real quick sometimes. Um, but I got to thinking, you know, watching him do these plays, like, you know what, if I had a script, if I if I knew what to say and I knew what the other person was going to say back, I think I might be pretty good at this. And so I started acting first year of high school. In that first year, I got uh, we were my class did uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and I got cast as Willy Wonka, like one of the leads, which all the other males wanted. And so I was like, man, this this maybe I'm good. I hope I'm good. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, I just I kept acting through high school, through college and even still today. And just over the years, you know, so many scripts being in my hand, reading so many scripts, I, I just, I felt like I had a, I've never had any formal playwriting classes or workshops, but just reading so many scripts, I felt like I had a, a good idea of how dialogue needed to flow, um, the successful plays, how, how the, the flow of those plays and how they should be written. Um, and then when I was in college, uh, during the summer, there wasn't really a big play they did. And one year, the drama group I was a part of decided, you know what, let's do a summer stock, just a bunch of short plays, you know, look through this catalog and pick out some short published plays that you want to do. But me, my brain was just like, you know what, I might try, I've seen enough scripts, I might just try writing one. And, and you know, and that's how I'll dip my toes in directing. And so I did that and I uh, did that a couple of years. And usually, you know, my plays are always well received. Um, I will say that recently I looked back at some of them and they're complete garbage, <laughs> you know, seeing where I came from and where I am today. I'll, I can read that old stuff and be like, Oh man, that's, that's terrible. I don't want anyone to see that. Uh, Do you find that that's subjective as well? Self subjection, if you will. Uh, yeah, it definitely can be because, you know, writing styles can change over time as you experience more mediums, you know, watching, movies and stuff and growing up you know my you know i would end up watching a lot of like twilight zone episodes with my mom or we'd watch 
movies over and over again because back then we didn't have streaming services we had like hbo which would play the same movies over and over again during the month so like i said i just i absorbed all these different stories and the way they were told and and that's how because a lot of my early plays and even some of my plays today I'm, i'm really twilight zone inspired i like to throw in bizarre things and stuff like that um but but yeah and and so after i graduated college there wasn't many it was it was a few years before i started writing again uh, a lot of the local theaters there were community theaters always doing the audience friendly type stuff to make sure they sell out seats uh, but then this intimate little black box theater opened up in town called a chat noir and they started doing the edgier plays that the other theaters weren't doing and i was like oh this is cool this is the kind of acting i want to do and and so i got involved in that theater and then a few years after they opened, they decided, you know what, we're going to do a short play festival. And and one of the guys that ran the place, he remembered that I wrote plays in college and he asked me, he goes, you got anything? I was like, well, I, I don't, but you know what, I'll, I'll write something and, and, and I'll see if you like it. And, and I wrote something for that. That's about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And I wrote something for them and, uh, and they liked it and it was part of their short play festival and that they've been doing it for 12 years now. Um, this this short play festival and every year I have something to submit and that was kind of the start because in college I didn't really know about submitting out to different theaters around the world it was just I would submit to what I heard about locally and that was it because I just didn't know Um, and even if it was a thing back then it probably wasn't as abundant as it is now because 10 minute play festivals have become wildly popular, especially in recent years. And you can look online and see all kinds of play opportunities, writing opportunities. Um, so yeah, it was about 10 years ago that when I started writing for Le Chat Noir, their annual play festival, that I realized that there's a world beyond just local productions. And that's when I started submitting out. And when I got my first theater that wanted to produce one of my works, you know, they never met me. It wasn't like they were doing me a favor. They weren't a friend. <laughs> Um, that's what I was worried about the local productions because it's like, are you just doing this because you know me? You know, you because because we're cool like that. Uh, but when you have someone who doesn't know you, never met you, and they're just basing if they want to produce your work based on what they read, that's a really cool feeling. And then you know, once I got that first production, uh, the first one I ever had in another city was in Pittsburgh, and then uh, I just started submitting it out, and I started writing more plays, and just over time, I just had a bunch of my short plays were getting produced in all these different cities just around the world. And I try to see as many of them as I can, but obviously that doesn't always work out. Sure. Where do you, there's so many things I want to, I want to touch on in that uh, last, um, those last statements. So Mm -hmm. first off, where, where did you start looking for submissions? Where do you look for submissions now to send your work in? Where's your go-to? Uh, well, Let's see. There's a couple of websites. Um, there's a emailing group called the Playwriting Binge, which a fellow playwright told me about a few years back that I joined. So they'll post opportunities. Just they'll email out to everyone and say, "Hey, here's an op. You know, if you live in this state or if you have this kind of play, they're looking for this, and and you, they'll, you'll have a website there and everything." Um, and then there's also, I believe it's called nycplaywrights.org. They'll they'll okay. usually have daily opportunities um and then i think the playwrights writing center i think is what it's called um yeah and just just random places online really that that i okay yeah okay and then um you i want to i want to kind of for somebody who has no formal training i want to i want to know how you kind of taught yourself because it's I'm fascinated because I go back and forth on whether or not there's a necessary academic approach to this. I'm not saying that it's not helpful. I'm just wondering if it's necessary to study and, and, and how much you can, again, it's nothing against whatever bachelor programs that are out there or MFAs. I'm just, Mm. I just I'm trying to dissect what constitutes a playwright and 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 how you, how you can traverse the pathway, if you will. So we're like 
I can and I appreciate the whole Twilight Zone thing. I'm a huge fan myself. So, but I mean, what were the obstacles that you faced? How did you, what, what, where did you, where were, what were the mistakes? How did you achieve them? How did you recognize them? And then how did you learn as you went? Well, um, like I said, one of the things that helped me the most was just being involved in theater and getting into acting at an early age and, and reading scripts regularly. Um, I would say one of the things that, that I guess took me a while to learn was to establish the proper conflict in scenes. Uh, Cause it, when I first started writing, I guess I, I don't want to say I was getting lucky, but just the way I was writing, there was always conflict there that made things interesting. And I remember there was a play that I wrote uh, probably around 2016, 17. And it was mainly three girls. Uh, they were waiting. There was, there was an asteroid coming down on the planet and it was, it was the end of the world and they were just kind of waiting for it to happen. But the whole play is them just kind of reminiscing of old times. And there's not really the conflict is with nature, but it doesn't come until the very end. And it was basically a play of just talking heads. And it, I didn't realize that when I first wrote it, but I remember I, and strangely enough, uh, there was a theater that, you know, they did a performance of it, all that. And uh, we performed it locally and it was actually performed again after I revised it a little bit. Um, but one of the feedbacks I got, a lot of theaters don't give you feedback, but there was one I submitted to that did. And they basically kind of mentioned that, um, it, it didn't really, they didn't feel the conflict. It was just people talking. <laughs> and we, sure. which, uh, I, read, I read back through it. I was like, yeah, that's kind of what it is. And you don't really get the conflict till the end when everything comes crashing down. Um, Literally. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah. So after I got that, you know, thinking about it, I, I, I revised it and I kind of made ongoing things happening throughout the play. And since I did that, it's been produced uh, even more. Um, and then I had another play, which I got another learning experience. Uh, one of the, it was actually performed in Washington, DC with the source festival. It was one of the first performances of it. And with that festival, they actually reviewed it in a newspaper and, you know, everyone kind of read the review. And one of the things they said it was good, but one of the things that they mentioned was one of the characters, basically just about every line he said was a question. And I was, and it felt like that was his only purpose for being there was just to ask questions to move toward the story along. And so when I read that, I was like, huh. And I read back through the script. I was like, you know what? He's kind of right. It's like, I wonder if that's a thing. And sure enough, you know, looking online at different writing samples, they kind of say that, you know, every character should have a purpose, not just to be there to ask questions to move things along. So again, that was another play that I went back through and revised it a little bit um, based on that feedback. And again, that's another one that's gotten more productions. That one's actually getting performed in October in Connecticut. So it's still, it's still having a good run, even though it had that one little flaw that someone pointed out that I, I feel like I kind of corrected it once I got that feedback. Uh, but yeah, it's been a learning process as I go. Um, like I said, I never had any writing, creative writing classes or workshops or anything like that. Everything I've learned is just from reading scripts myself, or, uh, you know, sometimes I, I have looked at you know, different articles on online of, you know, writing good screenplays and, and scripts like that. Sure. And just my own personal, you know, research, I would say, has helped me. Well, I've read a ton of stuff as well. And, and even when I was just starting out, but I couldn't and, and forgive my listeners for the repetition in this story. Um I didn't know what I was looking for. So I didn't recognize what made something good. So mm -hmm. I could sit back and I could write what I thought was, was good. And you know, what I thought the story was um, not recognizing that, you know, if there was conflict or anything like that. So it wasn't until I started kind of becoming like a, um, a guest reader and then when I started my own festivals, when I started getting submissions, when I was getting some stuff that was like, oh, ouch, this is, for lack of a better word, bad. Uh, and that's not to trivialize the achievement of, of finishing a play. I think that's a huge achievement. And I think that some people think because they finish, they're done. 
and that's not necessarily the case. But it wasn't until then that I started recognizing what made good stuff great. So how did you know? How did you know that? Was, was it because you were submitting to things that you were getting that feedback and it was helpful? And, and how did you, what was your attitude towards that feedback? They, were you open to it? Were you accepting it? Or were you like, ah, oh, they don't know what they're talking about? Because I know that there's playwrights out there that that feel like, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm always open to feedback. I mean, like I said, that play festival in Washington, you know, they actually they accepted the play. They performed it. You know, apparently their readers didn't see anything wrong with the script. It was just one of the newspaper reviewers that came and saw it. You know, he just he mentioned that, you know, this character just seems like he's only there to just ask questions. He doesn't really serve any of the purpose. Um so yeah, and, and I welcome stuff like that. It did make me relook at it, and I did kind of reword how the script flowed, and uh, I think that's important. And I, right now, I would say I don't think I ever finish a play. <laughs> I get it to a good enough state where I can submit it out, but even today, before I submit to theaters, I'll read through stuff again, and and I'll be like, huh, you know, that word's kind of weird. Let me change that, um, and that before I send it out. Um, and that's, I do that with every place still today. Well, well, that's a common, a common comment that, that happens a lot in this podcast. It's like, there's a lot of people like, are, you know, are we ever done? You know, the, you know, and it's, so what point do you say, okay, this is, this is as far as I'm going now, I'm going to submit it. Are you happy at that point? Or do you just like, I'm going to submit it, see what the feedback is and then adjust from there. Or as far as you're concerned, I'm done as best as my knowledge goes. So let's see what, how the, what the critics say for lack of. Yeah. I mean, I, I get my scripts to a state where I find them producible. Like me, I've directed plays. So right. if I get my script to a point where I'm like, you know what, if I was handed the scripts, I would know what to do with it. And I would know how to direct it. If I was an actor, I think I could probably understand how each line needs to be delivered um, and once I get a play to kind of that point where I see it is producible, not exactly, like I said, I, I don't feel like I'm ever finished with any play because I always go back and just make little, little, little changes here and there. Um, but, but yeah, once I get, once I feel like it's producible, that's when I kind of start sending it out unless there's like a deadline approaching and I'm just like, okay, I got to get this done now because the deadline's Friday and sometimes I'll rush things. And, but even then I still feel like it's producible. I don't think I'd ever send a theater or anything that I wouldn't want to produce myself. So the plays that you submit that receive feedback, are those fee based? I'm just um, curious. I'm curious if, you know, if like, if that's a, if that's a, um, I don't, a perk, you know, it's like, Hey, look, this is the submission fee, but this is what you're going to get. If you don't get accepted, you're still going to get feedback. I'm just curious. I'm just trying to um, I don't, unpack this and delve into I, it. I don't submit to that many festivals with fees, and I don't. And usually, I don't see feedback as involved um, with Stagecraft when I submitted my full length play for them to consider if it would be something to adapt to a film. Um, that one did have a fee, and that one did have in the submission it says feedback you'll get feedback on this so i thought that was a little bit worth it since it was my first full length play um just to get that um but i don't think the play in washington dc had a submission fee and and it wasn't the, it wasn't the theater's feedback it was the reviewer's feedback right sure uh, but yeah a lot of play festivals that i submit to i don't see where they give um feedback like that I'm just, I'm just curious. It's, you know, I mean, it's, it's work. I mean, well, it's work to read a play and it's work to, you know, to write up feedback. I'm just curious if that, if that's a, if that's a beneficial perk, you know, if know you're the, pay for something. Um, the Pittsburgh new works festival, they're one, they have a submission fee and they do give you feedback by, I think two or three different judges read it and they send you all their remarks. Oh, so I have submitted sure. I have submitted to that one a couple of times, and that one was actually the first time I had a play produced in another city. It was in 2009, and it was uh, it was produced by them, and they gave me the feedback and all that, as well as putting it on. And then I've submitted in years after that, and I've had one other acceptance. But even when it's not accepted, 
and it's rejected, you still get the feedback from the judges with, with that festival. <laughs> Well, no, I would hope so. I mean, if you're, if you know, if you're going to do a, a submission fee, I think that, you know, I think that should maybe be included, you know, even if it's post post production, once they've, you know, closed whatever, whatever plays they chose to be produced. Um, you let's, let's, let's sort of fast forward a little bit. We might go back to some other things in this, but I do want to talk about the Smith and Krauss aspects. I don't think that anybody that I've talked to, in past episodes has, has been published by this group. So what, what was that process? How, did you submit to them? Did they find your work? What were the requirements? What were, that, that was, um, they did do a, it, I was in the best 10 minute plays of 2015. And then also the best 10 minute plays of 2017, I believe. And basically they had a submission call that was like, if you had a new play produced in 2015 at any theater, you know, give send us, I think you had to either send them, you had to send them the details. Maybe you had to send them a picture of the program where your play right. was listed or a website. I think it was where it showed that you, your players produced and you send it to them for consideration to be in their, you know, best 10 minute plays of 2015, 2016, whatever year it was. And I, the two times I submitted them was 2015 and 17. And they're, they're mainly looking for new plays that premiered that year. Um, so is this the same group that's done? There used to be applause. Um, I think uh, we've all got them. Any, any, any actors got a copy as I turn my back to the camera. I apologize, everybody. Um, not that those people that are listening can can see. Um, oh God, where is it? Because I think we've all got like the best short plays of 2015, 2016, or the two that I have is 1992 to 1993. Um, is that the same? Is that the same one? Is it's that the same group? Concept. It's a similar concept. I know the person that used to um, choose and edit that book was uh, Larry Harbison. Um, okay. And then he left and someone else does it now, a lady named okay. Debbie. Um, but yeah, it's still a, it's still a thing every year. If I guess if you go to the Smith and Cross website, they, if you've had a new play produced that year, they'll take submissions. Is this, we're we talking about the same thing or are we talking uh, totally different? Something it's, it's different. Okay, <laughs> I mean, good. Just make it clear. It's a similar, okay. concept, similar concept, but it's a different, uh, different publisher and all that. Fair enough with this. I don't need to put this down. Um, so what, so they choose your play, and you've been you've been accepted into this how many times? Um, twice. Twice. Okay. And um, do you get proceeds? You get. Um, they they send you a copy of the book, and then I believe you, when I I don't know what they do nowadays with the new editor, but I know when I submitted, they also send you like a flat fee. You don't get like ongoing royalties for each book sold, but they're like, here, we'll give you this much to publish your book. Uh, to publish your play in our book, which it has like 50 other plays in it. Um, sure. So, yeah. But yeah, and they also, it's, it's cool to get a copy of the book because you, you know, you see your words in there and it's, it's, it's always right. fun to have a hard copy of, of your material. Now they, do they do the standard um, print at, before your play? It's like, Hey, you know, this is a subject to royalties. If you want to produce this play and this is who you contact. And then do you have your own information in there? They do. They put your contact information in there and they let readers know, you know, if you if you like this play, if you want to produce it, then contact this email address or. Uh, yeah, I think it was just an email address. I don't think they put a right. phone number or a mailing address in there. Right. And so you have your email or do you have representation that handles that for you? For me, I use my own email because I don't okay. have representation. OK, fair enough. And do you how do you negotiate your fees when when you get contacted if you've gotten contacted i'm only assuming I, the stuff that I've, I've seen of yours i really enjoy so i'm assuming that your phone's ringing off the hook um with them it was just every playwright got the same thing it wasn't there was no sure. negotiation um right but i mean if somebody contacts jonathan cook and they say hey i really like this play we want to put it up for a two week run or we want to stage it at, you know, for a, a weekend of one acts at this college. How do you go about that? 
Well, when that's happened, it's always been for my short plays. And okay. uh, I basically, if it's for college, I don't mind just saying, hey, if your students are doing it, it's fine. It's free. Um, but I do kind of start out. I know it's, it's bad to say this, but colleges and high schools, they have education money to spend. You know, they, they have money no. allocated to spend. One. And so they've got a, they've got a good budget. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not so, pretend. And so I, I will start off like, you know, this 10 minute play, you know, usually like, you know, $10 per production, you know, let's say a dollar a minute, something like that. Well, and then I'll throw in at the end, you know, whatever fits your budget. Um, sure. And if they come back and they're like, Oh, you know, we're just, you know, it's our students, it's gonna be a free event, you know, then I, I'll, I'll get back to them. Like, you know what? It, it's cool. You can, you guys can do it. Um, but okay. yeah, I do kind of start off just, just, to have something, you know, and just say, you know, it's ten dollars a play for a ten minute play. That's cool with me. So when you come up with, so when you start a play, mm-hmm. where I don't want to say where do you start. You know, obviously the beginning is a great place to start. But do you start with a premise? Do you? What's your process, I suppose, what it all comes down to? Where do you start and then where do you go from there? What are the next steps that follow once you have an idea? Oh, man, that's um, – I would say for me, I don't know how everyone else does it, but every play is kind of different. Um, sure. Memento Mori, for example, the one that you saw, that came about just because I had come across – I had come across articles about postmortem photography, and I thought – that was just kind of let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and talk about it. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and tell people what it is. It's a, a phenomenal play. I really, really enjoyed this. And it's there's some I I come from one of the festivals I do is noir, uh, mm-hmm. film noir. And there are some wonderful noir aspects to this play. And I think that's some somewhat of re- really spoke out to me. So let's talk about what it what the premise is, and then we'll talk about how you came up with the idea, and then we can we can kind of go from there and un- unpack it. So the premise is um, there's a teenage girl that passed away and her mother hires a, poor, a post-mortem photographer to come take her photo because they didn't take many photos while they were, she was alive. Um, and then he has this kind of supernatural ability to temporarily reanimate corpses. And so when the mother leaves a room, he, has it like i said he has his power i don't explain how he got it because you know i don't go into those kind of details but he he brings her back to life and for him it lets him take photos that look lifelike and realistic because at the time without the clients knowing this this corpse actually was alive when he took the picture and but they just all think that he's you know he's just this best photographer he knows how to pose them perfectly and make them look lifelike but what he's really doing is he brings them back to life he takes her photo and then he deanimates them i guess um, but this takes he, place when this one this happens in like the 1800s when this was actually okay. a thing, and uh, and but when he brings this teenage girl, this particular teenage girl, to life, um, she kind of tells him how she died and that her father had something to do with it, which no one else knows. You know, she passed away. They think she just fell down the stairs and. And when she reveals, no, why, why do you keep saying I fell? He's like, I, she's like, I didn't fall. You know, I, my, my father pushed me down the stairs. And so all this stuff just kind of starts unraveling and he doesn't know what to do. He, he can't tell the mom because how would he know? Because she doesn't know that he has this power to bring this girl back to life. And he could be accused of witchcraft and all that. If anyone found out, he just, so he just, he tries to figure out a way to let the mom know without actually telling her and that's what the ending is about as he's the little girl tells her about this um diary she had that was underneath some floorboards in her room but her mom would never look there because she didn't know about it so as the photographer's leaving he's like you know i used to have a friend that lived in this exact house and i remember in his room there was this and so as he's leaving he just mentions that and so and he he mentions that you know there might be something still in there that you know maybe he had left behind when he lived here and so that's the parting words he leaves her with. And so you just got to assume that the mother did go up there and kind of look in there. And then she finds her daughter's diary where she mentions her father was um, abusive and, and all that, which she never knew about. Uh, so that, that's kind of the whole premise <clears throat> of the play. And the way that started was, like I said, I, 
I came across just articles of postmortem photography. Where, where do you come across articles like that? <laughs> I'm just curious. Scrolling Facebook, Instagram, it just I, it, and I, I I really don't even remember how how it popped up in like my feed or wherever. But and I was just like, oh, let me let me check this out. And I was just looking at all these different photographs, and I just thought it was the coolest thing because back then it wasn't it wasn't a morbid thing. It was just something regularly done that it was a kind of like a, a celebration, a way to capture their loved ones since they didn't have cameras and stuff regularly while the person was alive. So they wanted at least one, one photograph before the corpse gets buried or whatever. Um, and so I just, I, th I thought that would be, that's such a unique occupation. And I thought it would make such an awesome backdrop for a story. I didn't know what the story was going to be, but I was like, I would love to, I just want to write a play with, a character that has that occupation. And as I started thinking through it, um, and of course the Twilight Zone inspiration comes in my head where I like bizarre supernatural type things. And I was like, you know what? And then as I started writing things, just I discovered things along the way. Um, and so I, I knew that I wanted to give him this kind of special gift where he could bring her to life. And, and then they have this moment and, uh, and that, that's just kind of how it unfolded as I went along was just because I, I found, I just kind of got this fascination with these postmortem photography articles that I found and I read about. And as I learned more about it, I was like, you know, this is, this is, I haven't seen a play with a character like this, you know, that does this kind of thing. I want to write that play. And that's what I did. You mentioned that you don't really talk about it in your mind. Do you know, how he does it, but you don't, I know you don't touch about out on the plane. I, not that you have to, I'm just curious if in your mind, you know how he does it, but you don't really go into it. Um, what does it matter? Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of one of those things. What does it matter? That's not, that's not the beef of the story. Sure. Like, and even in the play, he even says it himself. He's when she's asking, you know, what, what happened? How's How am I doing this? What would I do? And he's, he mentions, you know, I don't know how it works, but it works. And that's that's basically the only explanation you get about how he's able to do it. It's just something he learned he was able to do. Maybe he himself doesn't even know how he does it. Maybe it's just something he – a gift he was born with. Maybe he was cursed in some way. But whatever it is, his only response to her was, I don't know how it works, but it works. And he is able to bring her alive. Yeah. Do you get flack for that, for not explaining it? You know, I never have. <laughs> Um, no, and I'm I'm glad because I think that there's a suspension of disbelief that needs to go along with this, and I don't think it's important to the story. Mm -hmm. um, I think that not that you just brush past it, but it's just like I think that's kind of enough. I don't know how, yeah. and I think I there's mean, a lot it, of things like that in the world that we just kind of have to accept. I like, don't know how it works, but it just does. Yeah, and the thing about it, it's a you know, ten, it's about a fit. I will say I wrote probably a 15 minute version of it. But I know for short and sweet, they like 10 minute plays, really tidy. So when I was working with that director, we did trim some stuff out. Um, nothing important. It was mainly throwaway lines just to kind of keep the story going. Sure. Um, but if I ever did expand on it, if, if it was a full length play, then yes, I'd probably go into that. But with it being just a 10 minute play, we're just capturing a snapshot of this interaction it didn't feel important. The important thing was learning about this girl's past and how she died. But sure. like I said, if I ever expand on the story, if I ever do make it, I don't know, a short film or even a, a full length play, that is something that I would dive into because for a full length play, people sitting through a whole play, I think you'd have to give them a little something All right? how he got this. But a 10 minute play, sure. I would find with not explaining too much. When you went through and you had to cut it down to make it a, a more tight 10 minute, did you find that that made it better or do you think that it lost a few things? Um, I would Charm say. Charm or character or insight. Do you, how did it affect it? Did it make it better or did it kind of like other things you kind of missed? I would say it. it I, don't know, I know I called them. I hate to call them throwaway lines because they're not, it's all a part of character building. Um, so I think that it did lose a little bit of the character building with the different interactions. Um, but there was enough still in there that the story still worked. People still understood it and liked it. And they, uh, you know, they were along for the ride just like the actors were. 
So once you make a final, once you, let's just say you, you do your first draft, um, what's your next step from there? First draft? Yeah. Um, or are you like one and done? You're that good. It's just like, ah, boom. I got no, it. Do you edit as you go or do you like finish it and then like, okay, now let me go ahead and read this and see what I need to. I will say um, with a 10 minute play, I guess it's a little bit different. Um, I probably would write the whole thing first and then I'd look back over it and tidy up where I need to expand where I need to wordsmith a lot uh, with a full length play. Anytime I've ever done that, if I write a scene the next day, if I'm, if I want to start another scene, I'll look back at the first scene just to kind of go over it a little bit, chisel it. And then I'll start a second scene and then, the next day, if I'm starting the third scene, I'll kind of look back everything up to that point. Um, I, I do that regularly with so a full two, play. Two questions. Um, let me. I'll go back to the other one in a second, but since we're at this point, real quick, do you know where you're going? Let's say you've gotten all right. I've got scene one done. Start the next day. Scene two. Did you know where you were going when you ended scene one, or like? When you're ready, I'm going to go back and revisit and see where this is going. And then that's how, or do you, do you know exactly what this is and where you're going? Or do you just kind of like figure it out as, as you go along? All right. So I guess a full length play, I will generally try to write out an outline. Like I'll know specific moments that I want to happen within the play to lead to the ending, which I, I always try to figure out the ending before, I start writing because it gives me a goal that I'm going towards. Sure. Yeah. Um, so my outline, I'll, I'll kind of have like a beginning, how it starts, the ending, and then I'll have all these points in the middle where I'm like, okay, I need this to happen. And at some point this needs to happen and this. And then when I start writing, I just kind of let the dialogue kind of, I let the characters talk and get me to those certain key points that I mapped out. Um, and then, so once I get to each little plot point that I want to hit, it's like I kind of check off the box. I'm like, okay, I hit that plot point. All right, now how do I get to the next plot point? And then ultimately, I'm, I'm working my way to, to the end, um, hopefully making a nice, fluid story along the way, which is why I like to, before I start a new scene, I always go back and read the previous stuff that led up to it, just so I'm not contradicting myself anywhere along the way. And that that helps me. I know some people don't like to look back at their first scenes they just kind of like the eh, all right that scene's done let me let me finish the whole thing and then i'll go back and do it but with a full length play i kind of like to edit as i go along a little bit sure well that's that's a new thing for me that i finally started doing and just got to a point where like i'm just going to finish and the reason why is because i will work on the same 10 pages the first 10 pages the first 20 oh. pages over and over and, and i will never move forward um i'm, I'm kind of a right you what's that I said, I've been guilty of that as well. Uh, eventually, yeah. if I find myself dwelling too much on those early scenes, I'm just like, you know what? I've looked over this every day. I just got to, I'm going to, let me just get up to this next scene. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Been- and I'm not saying there's a right or wrong um, way to do it. I think whatever works for anybody is, you know, and I think you, as you continue to write, you find what works best for you. I think the important thing is, is that you just sit down and you write. Um, and then, so how, I mean, do you have everything outlined before you sit down and you write? I wouldn't say everything. I leave a little, a little freedom just for okay. other things to happen along the way, possibly. Um, but for big major points that I know I want in there, I'll, I map those out. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, with most writers, there's discovery along the way. As your characters sure. are talking, there's just things that you haven't thought of that they kind of remind you of. It's like, hey, you sure. know, this, this could happen, you know. Um, but yeah. Are, are there mythological aspects or archetypes that you that you follow, that you include? Do you, do you kind of do the hero's journey thing at all in your plays? Like, this is this person, this is their purpose, or it's just like, I've kind of got my concept, and if those things magically or happily appear, you're, you're great with it? Or do you, like, purposely include some of those things and and i'll go into structure with that as well after after you answer that okay so let's see 
It's not, and I don't, certainly not a trick question by any means. It's just like, we haven't really discussed that in the, like, you know, there's always writers that, oh, this is the purpose. You got to include these things. You got to have the mentor. You got to have the, you know, antagonist, the protagonist, the hero, the. With, uh, with playwriting, I don't really focus on a structure. I just kind of write what feels good to me. Um, It's kind of like my own little personal journey. Um, to structure that along the way and, and write characters that I like writing. And, and basically, I'm trying to write a play that I want to see. And if other people like it, that's cool. Now, screenplays, that it's, it's weird. Wow. I, take, I take screenplays a different approach because I do kind of follow, okay, I need uh, a climax here at, at page 60. You know, I, and I, I, I do that with screenplays for some reason, but with playwriting – um, you know, with scenes that can be 10, 15 pages, whereas a screenplay, you're writing three pages or less per scene just to keep the flow of the story uh, quick and, and edited well. Um, it's a, yeah, screenplay writing and, and playwriting is totally different approaches on my end. Uh, screenplays, I, I do try to follow a structure. Playwriting is more like a playground to me, a sandbox where I just kind of, I, I just do my own thing with it and I'm writing a play that I want to see. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you find that was, it was that an obstacle you had to overcome? Because I find that especially nowadays, you've got some beginning playwrights that's kind of like take a screenplay or a cinematic approach to their playwriting where it's like, well, well, well that's like, you just wrote a scene where it was four lines. You, you, there's got to be more to it than that. <laughs> We're not going to do a scene change here. Did you find that you kind of wrote in that same mentality or did you, and that you had to overcome that or did you know better? Uh, I think mine was the reverse because I started out playwriting first. Okay. So when I, when I started trying to write screenplays, I remember some of my early s- scripts that I wrote were, you know, 10, 15 page long scenes. And that's kind of like a production nightmare because uh, that's just not really how you do unless you're, you know, Tarantino writing all this sna- snippy, snappy dialogue, um, which he has long scenes like that. Uh, but for the majority of p- films out there, if you read the scripts, most scenes are three pages or less, sometimes four, maybe five. Uh, and, and again, just like with reading play scripts all the time. I started reading a lot of screenplays and just seeing how those were done. And yeah, it's a, it's a totally different monster. You know, it's a totally sure. different approach for screenplays and playwriting. Did reading those screenplays that did that help with your playwriting at all? Or do you think that it just kind of not necessarily interfered, but. Um, with, I wouldn't say it helped playwriting, I guess. You know, film is more of a visual medium, whereas, I mean, plays is a, of course, you're on stage, but it's, I think sure. plays tend to be more dialogue driven. Um, whereas a screenplay, you want to make sure the visual is there um, along with dialogue. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say it really affected how I write plays. Um, I kind of like the 10, 15 page, 20 page scenes. I like doing that. But then, you know, when I switch over to screenplay writing, it is kind of a relief to be like, oh, oh, three pages. Okay, I'm done with that scene. Cool. <laughs> and sure. then just to move on to the next next little snippet. You know, maybe the next scene's only one page, which you don't find that in playwriting unless, you know, there's some playwrights out there that did start off with screenplays and they kind of use that format for plays. But like you said, you're not really going to do, be doing a bunch of scene changes like that, you right. know, in a play. Is there a playwright that, kind of inspired you or that you learned a lot from that you, that you kind of, um, aspire to be, that's not the right word. Um, Oh, I mean, this, this kind of changes over time, but I'm really, uh, who are you most influenced by? How's that? I really like, uh, John Polano, which he's also a screenwriter. Um, he did small engine repair and, uh, rules of seconds, which we performed here in Augusta. We, we performed small engine repair as well. Um, but uh, he kind of, his, his play rules of seconds is a little, since he writes screenplays too, it is a little cinematic. He does have kind of quick scene changes in that. 
Um, but yeah, I'd probably out of like today, he's probably the one that I, um, I don't know, that I, I read the most of. And uh, oh, what's his name? Lieutenant of Inishmore. Who's the person? The 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 Irish playwright McDonough. Yeah, that's him. I and like Bruges his work. and uh, and yeah. the, uh, uh, three billboards. Is that what it is? Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Uh, that's exactly yeah. what I was thinking of as well when you right before you had mentioned him. Yeah, yeah, he's a uh, excellent. Uh, I love his plays. I love his movies. You know, I love uh, his work as well. Um, he's another one that I you know any any play of his that I read, I just know I'm going to love it. Um, and yeah, it's just it, it changes over time. I'm sure in a few months it might be someone else. So. So for somebody who's starting off, who's like, I want to, I want to write plays. I don't know how to go about it. I don't know if I, I can't afford college. What is, what's Jonathan Cook's advice in that regard? Let's see. Um, I, I'd say. What do you recommend? The, one of the best things to do is if you want to write, it might be nice to actually get on stage and act in a play. Even if you have a super small role. Um, you'd kind of get a feel for how plays are performed um, rather than just going to, you know, see a play. You'd actually go through the rehearsal process and see how all that happens. Um, and then again, just read a lot of scripts, um, kind of like like what I did over the years. And, you know, kind of find you can find your own voice. It's, you don't have to mimic other playwrights, uh, but you can kind of take inspiration. And then along the way, you find your own voice and then eventually the scripts you write will in a way have your dna in them you know we, people will be able to read it and be like oh that you know that's a that's a that's a jonathan cook play or that's a you know martin mcdonough play because you know you can read a martin mcdonough play and you know it's a martin mcdonough play and sure. i think kind of you know even if you you're not a super successful professional playwright if you can get to a point where you have your own voice and people can recognize your writing. I think that's a, kind of a form of success for me. You mentioned not in in the asteroid play. You had conflict to the end, and then you had to, you realized that you didn't have conflict. How do you approach conflict now? And how do you recommend? Because I think a lot of beginning playwrights they don't really have conflict. They they just have sometimes it's just talking heads, you know. Um, yeah. So how do you how do you implement uh, yeah. conflict and how? soon do you bring that in yeah and that's uh, like you said that was um something I've, I, I've i've written plays that are just talking heads and i've read you know on the podcast where i do the audio plays Ooh. i've gotten submissions where it's just talking heads and it's like i don't nothing's happening here i mean i i this isn't engaging enough um so i would say establish a conflict before you even start writing what what is what's happening in the story what is each character's what's their goal what is their intent um because a play that's just talking heads whether you're trying to make i don't know a, a political statement or social statement that doesn't always while your intent may be meaningful it doesn't always come across well as a play it just sounds like you're putting your own personal opinion out there so it's kind of nice to have conflict built in if you do want to make a statement like that in a play. Sure. And I'm, I, I'm not saying, well, when I, this statement is not to say that conflict isn't necessary, but I, I also want to reiterate that sometimes a play that's more relationship driven is still acceptable. I'm not saying that, you know, and I'm sure there's conflict within there usually, whether it's not even internal conflicts within those two characters that may not be between those th themselves, you know, those two. Um, I'm not saying that it can't be done by any means. That's the one thing I want to make sure that I'm clear about as well. Um, you mentioned a word a little while ago, uh, wordsmithing. What is yes. that and how, so talk to what's, what's that process like? To me, um, that's where, uh, like I said, when I'm writing a full length play, if I go back and look at a scene and maybe I just, I'll, I'll kind of say the lines out loud to myself. And if something is just not flowing right, I'll find a way to reword a sentence or two um, just to kind of make it sound more natural. And that also comes along with when you get actors together to read the script. If, 
if they're having trouble kind of if they're stumbling over lines you know multiple times then maybe it's not them maybe it's kind of you know look back at the writing and see if you can reword things um to to make it flow better and be more natural okay um when you when you submitted to smith and kraus um did they require a certain format they or did you just get to send it in however you had it written on a page i believe they just kind of said standard playwriting format which that tends to be different for everyone from what i've noticed yeah um, and that's I mean, why i want to add that's why I ask, and I'll get into that in a sec. So, in what what was the form? Do you do you know the format that you were in? Uh, you know, I my, my format kind of changes every sure. now and then. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't really it, it just you you put the character's name above the dialogue, and uh, and you have the stage directions on the right side, and all that. Um, Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's why I asked because, and again, sorry for previous episodes where this has come up. I'm fascinated by this. So that's why I wanted to ask because it's never how they're printed. No, it's not. And it drives me nuts. Why are you requiring it like this? If this isn't how it's printed, because if I'm reading a play, this is how I think it's supposed to be formatted. Yeah. You're, you're, you're selling me a false bill of goods. Gosh, darn it. You're pissing me off. So that's why. I'm curious um, what format do you, is that how you, is that what you write in normally or do you reformat when you submit it? Because it's like, Oh, now I got to do it. Or you just save yourself the time and I'm going to reform. I'm going to, I'm going to format it the right way now. And then on that note, is there a program that you use or do you kind of do it manually? I do it manually. And I just, since so you, you know, do you write word then? I do. So like 12 okay. years ago when I first started writing plays and when I started submitting, I saw most theaters asking for this standard playwriting format. I was like, well, what is that? So I looked into it. And like I said, you can look at several different websites and they'll show you several different things, but most of them are kind of similar. So I just kind of tried to stick to one basic thing. It's readable. It's similar to all, what all the standard playwriting formats that I found. And, uh, and that's kind of what I've been going with, but no, I totally get that. You know, you read a printed script or a published script and it's totally different than what the standard playwriting format is. So yeah, I don't understand that either, but yeah, in yeah, word, I, I just set all the margins and I just kind of line everything up myself. Fair enough. Yeah. I reached out to dramatist play services, but they don't want to have a talk with me because they're probably <laughs> shaking in their boots. Not really, but I'd like to think that they uh, have to give them a call back and call them out on it. Um, all right, fair enough. So you do it, you do it, because I know there's some plate plate people. Some people use Celtics, Celtics, I think it's called. And then you know, I mean, I, I'm primarily screenwriter for the most part, um, give or take a few plays, and I use Final Draft because I bought it a long time ago, and it's got it's got the format, so. Um, mm. You know, so it's it's easy enough. So let's talk about Gather by the Ghost Light. How long has this been going on? This is this is your this is your podcast. You you developed this. I did. Uh, it's I started it. Well, the first episode launched in 2020, and I guess the way it came about, uh, you know, because like I said, I have a, a filmmaking background, and when I first started writing short plays, and they were getting produced, I'm, uh, in my head, I was just like, oh man. I could just like, I could make a bunch of short films out of these plays and just kind of have my own little series. That'd be awesome. Sure. And then I just realized that was a whole lot more cumbersome than, <laughs> than yeah. I thought it was. Cause I was like this young, not realizing how much help and how many people would have to be involved every time I wanted to do that. Um, so I did, I, I think it was around 2014. I did adapt one of my short plays to a 30 minute short film and it turned out great. It was in a couple of festivals and everything. And then after I did that, I was like, there's no way I could do that as a regular thing. <laughs> Just with my schedule, my full-time work, I was like, this isn't a full-time job for me. So I wouldn't well, be able to money make money as well. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to make time to make this a regular thing. Sure. So fast forward a few years later, um, I got to thinking, you know, but I could probably make them into audio plays maybe. So around 2019, it was actually after – Memento Mori went up. That was the first play that I recorded when I, after I wrote it. And uh, we premiered it here in my hometown 
and I got that original cast, and I just had them talking to some mics and um, recorded them in 2019. Then a few months later, I was like, okay, I got this other play. I'll get the cast from that. And, and so I just started kind of vaulting all these little audio recordings I had. And then in 2020, when, you know, pandemic happened, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with all these recordings. And I was like, you know what? I mean, maybe I could just start this podcast idea and just release audio plays on there that I already recorded. Um, so I released the first episode in March of 2020, shortly after pandemic started. I was like, if people can't go to the theater, I will bring the theater to them. That was my mm -hmm. way. Of it. Um, so, and I edited it all together and everyone, it, everyone liked it. It got a good positive response, but then listening back to those old recordings, I was like, man, this could be so much better. <laughs> um, I, well, what can I do to make these better? And, uh, and so I ended up, I scrapped all the stuff I already recorded. And there's the local studio guy, which it was expensive, but I went in and started recording audio plays with him. And um, like once a month, I was putting out a new, a new play on the podcast of my own, something that I wrote. And, uh, and they were just sounding great. We we're getting a lot of positive feedback. Momentum was building. And then I started thinking about <clears throat> eventually I'm going to, I'm going to run out of this stuff. I only have so many short plays <laughs> Uh, and I've met just from going to play festivals to see my own works over the years. I met playwrights over the years. I've seen their plays and I knew of some good ones that, that would work great as an audio play. And I reached out to some of the playwrights and I was like, Hey, you know, I'm, I do this thing. Is it cool if I record your play? And um, some of them are a little hesitant at first, but then when they go and listen to it, like, Oh man, you do great work. You know? Yeah. Go ahead and do it. Um, so yeah, then I started producing other playwrights. And every now and then I'd mix in one of my own and I still do that today. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been great because I've met a lot of playwrights that I'd never met before. But like I said, with new play exchange, I just go and I'll, I'll read plays. I'll, if I see that a play has won an award in a festival, I'll make sure to go read it. And um, cause that way I don't have to do my own open submission call. Cause I'm just one guy. I can't read a ton of scripts. I don't really have the time for it. Um, so it's kind of like some of the plays that I find, they've already been vetted by other festivals, other theaters. And if they won multiple awards, it kind of works out. Um, and then on my own, if, if I have time, I will just kind of look for different and new play exchange, look for different, different themes. Uh, like I was recently looking for a 4th of July play and I came across, uh, Arthur M. Jolly. He had a, a 4th of July play and I was like, Oh, this is great. And it, it was a, he's an excellent writer and, uh, I did a little interview with him, just like you're doing with me now, and he's just a such a charming guy. Um, yeah, well, he he did a episode twelve, I think, with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so continue. Sorry. Yeah, it's cool. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and so yeah, that's and it's still going. And back in July, uh, local the Augusta Arts Council in Augusta, Georgia, they were. Um, they were taking grant submissions and I was like, you know what? I'm doing something creative. People like it. Uh, it's since when I started it, it's built up so much. I get a ton of listens every month and I, I kind of submitted to them to see if I can get a grant to actually start paying these writers and these voice actors that are coming in, just kind of doing me favors, you know, because being in the acting community, I know a lot of actors. Sure. And, uh, and so anytime I need someone, I'm like, Hey, you want to come record this? And they're always just happy. They're like, Oh yeah, thanks for asking me. I'll come do it. Um, so yeah. So now I'm at a point where I got this grant from the Augusta arts council and I'm able to actually pay my writers now, pay my voice actors. And it just, and none of it goes to me. I just, I, when I submitted for the grant, I was like, I just want this money. Here's how it's going to be allocated. I'm paying the actors this much, the writers this much. I'm going to do at least two episodes a month. Will you give me that much money for at least a year? And they were like, uh, "Okay, here you go." And I was like, oh, "Okay." Great. Now, did you have to establish a five hundred one c three for that, a nonprofit, or or they just kind of just say, "Oh, you're arts based," and so go to town? This was a specific grant for individuals. Okay, um, if you're an individual artist living in a living in they call it the CSRA, which is kind of the Augusta area and the surrounding areas. It kind of branches out to North Augusta and Aiken, South Carolina a little bit. Um, but if you live in this area and you're bringing art to this community, then you're eligible to submit for it. And they also did a separate grant for nonprofits, but the one I submitted for was for individuals. Okay. And 
one, one of the questions they did ask me was, you know, with your podcast being worldwide, how are you going to, how are you going to prove that you're bringing art to this area specifically? And I was like, I can, I can get the stats from my podcast server. You know, it shows me the regions where most people are listening. And, and I, I mean, I see the stats and it's mainly, well, it is worldwide and I get a lot of listens. The bulk of it comes from my surrounding area because these are the people I know. These are the voice actors I'm working with. They're telling their friends. And uh, and then, you know, the writers that I work with, they tell their people and it just ends up getting listened to all around the world. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so you're still going into the studio and doing it? Or are you doing it on your own? And uh, No, actually, at the um, November of 2020 was my last time going to the studio because I figured out, I was like, this isn't going to keep working. This is expensive. I'm not, because at the time I'm not, I don't make income from the podcast um, other than this grant, which Yet. still isn't income. It's like, because I'm using it to pay others. Uh, so in November was my last time recording <clears throat> with the studio, which I don't regret doing any of that because the guy that mixed and mastered those was just, he's a great studio, great guy to work with. Um, <clears throat> But in December, I just kind of bought my own stuff to record at home, and I um, converted one of my closets into a sound booth. And uh, and yeah, so I've just been recording at home since December 2020, and no one's been able to tell the difference that I stopped going to studios. So hopefully, that means I'm doing something right. <laughs> um, what what equipment are you using? Um, I think I use the same mic you have there the sure, the, the, the SM7, sure yeah. is that what it is uh i've got i've got two i don't know which one this is i think this is i think this is the m4 or mv7 i think uh, and i've got the other one the S, smb yeah that's what i have, I, I have yeah, I've got that one across for me for for in-house guests and then what are you what are you using for to record on it's um well you know the sure sm7b's they need a nice solid preamp so what i have is uh it's a Sound Devices Premix 3. And okay. that boosts, like you can record up to eight tracks at once. And I usually don't record, I don't record more than two at a time because that's how many mics I have. Um, right. And you can, you can boost that signal up and it doesn't bring up the noise floor and everything just sounds nice and smooth. And with the soundproofing I put up in the closet, it, I mean, it sounds like it's a legit studio. <laughs> and uh, awesome. yeah. So do you have both, do you have two actors in the closet? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. At a time? Yes. And then, so you bring those two in, and then you'll shoot if there's a third or a fourth, you bring them in separately later on? I do. Okay. And then, what do you edit on? I just, I use Adobe. Uh, okay. Adobe software. I'll just, um, I don't even, I'm so used to film editing that I just, I load all the audio into Premiere, and I'll just, okay. I'll edit the audio from that and export it from that. I know a lot of people probably use Audition or, um, What's the other one that's free? Uh, GarageBand, Audacity. Audacity, a lot, a lot of podcasts yeah. use Audacity. Um, but right. like I said, since I've done so much film editing over the years, it's so Adobe Premiere. I know all the shortcuts. I can just load in all the audio and just zoom everything around, put the effects on the music, and I'm I'm done with it much quicker than I would any other software. So on the that to note, so do you do you use Foley or you just use sound effects that you find online? I've done some Foley, but the majority of it is uh, sound effects libraries that I, uh, a couple of subscriptions. Um, and then sometimes when I can't find what I need, I, I will record it myself, um, which that's usually kind of fun. It just makes the process longer, but because <laughs> it's nice sure. when you can find the perfect effect or the perfect song uh, online where you just load it right in. But when I have to set everything up to record it myself, that's just an extra step, but I've done it. It works. And what about your music? Where do you find that? Um, that's kind of the same thing. A lot of the music I use is uh, from a subscription site where it's just kind of royalty free, free tracks. And they have a ton of them. Like a lot okay. of the tracks I've used, I've never really heard anywhere else. So, how, what are the length of plays that you're doing for this? How many pages or how, how long in, you know, time frame? Uh, I keep them kind of short. Like I said, a lot of the plays I find have been successful with a production history in 10 minute play festivals, stuff like that. So a lot of the plays I do are only about 10 minutes. Um, okay. And then with in an audio play format, they do tend to be a little bit longer. 
um, just because I put on the effects and the music to start and stop it. Um, and then after each episode, I try to get the the writer on to have a short talk about the play that the audience just heard. So in, in all, each episode that I release is probably about 30 minutes or so, 30, 35 minutes, because they hear the short play and then they hear the short interview. So right. it's, pretty, it's, kind of, it's kind of something that someone can listen to on their drive to work or drive just around town, quick, quick little commute. What's your turnaround? How fast does it take you to, to record, edit, upload? Um, if I have nothing else going on, I could do it. If only. Within like 24, 48 hours. Uh, during Christmas week, um, I, me and my family, we had gotten COVID in late November and early December. So I had, uh, I had scheduled some recording time during that, but I was like, oh, crap, no one can come over, can come over right now. So after we got better, I waited another week and a half, two weeks before I brought anyone over to record. And then, uh, and then once I did that, I was like, holy crap, I haven't released anything at all in December. And I like to do Christmas plays for December or holiday themed plays. And so <clears throat> on one day, I recorded. I had actors coming in like all day long. I recorded three plays. And then Christmas week, I put out three episodes that week just because I just got on and edited them really quick that, you know, pretty much that same day that I was recording, um, which that was a that was a pretty busy week. But I was off work that week and it was able I was able to just kind of focus on that and get it done. Do you are you in house only or do you have are you record remotely as well? There is one actress that I have recorded remotely twice. Um, and she, I met her a few years back. <clears throat> She's in Tampa, Florida. She directed a play that the Carrollwood Players Theater was producing one of my short plays, and she was the director. And we got to know each other just through emails and stuff, talking about that play. And that was in 2017, I, no, 2016. <clears throat> and so when I started doing this, it turns out uh, she's also a voice actor. She does like commercials and stuff and ads. And so I, I, she had asked about doing something remotely with me. And I was like, well, I mean, you can uh, send me a track and I'll see if it kind of blends in with what I record here. Cause you might be using different equipment. I just want to make sure it's kind of balanced. Right. Sure. I'm not, I'm not a hundred. I'm not opposed to it, but let's, right. uh, let's, let's do a test. And so she did that and it was, it was close enough. And so, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, she's been on two episodes and I'll probably have her on some more. She's got a, she's one of those actresses with a good natural instinct for how to deliver lines. She's with the voice actors I bring in, we usually do a couple of takes of each page. Um, right. some of them, I always let the actors kind of do, cause we don't really have a rehearsal. They just come over, they've read the script, they're familiar with it. And then instinctually I kind of see what they do before I start giving them notes. I'm like, here's the script. Let's start recording. Right. And that was one of my next questions is like, how do you like, let's say like maybe you got a three person scene and you've got the two people that that are there in house that may interact with each other. And so it's kind of natural. They can feed off of each other. But then you've got the third actor that's coming in, coming in later. So do you run into obstacles where it's like, oh, boy, that delivery does not match the the setup of that of that line? Do you, do you have that issue or is it just kind of a happy accident? Everything kind of seems to flow and people have natural instincts for the, with the actors and talent that you bring in. It's, it's mostly happy accidents. I mean, I've, uh, man, I've, I've been doing so much theater around town that the actors I choose, it's like, I just, I trust them. I've, I've been with them on stage acting across from them many times. And, um, and, and yeah. And usually when I do have a three person play, when I record the first two, usually the third one is kind of, you know, waiting to go in. So he'll kind of hear how they've done right. it. Okay. Um, okay. Even though he's not in there delivering lines with them in the moment, um, they'll, he or she will hear. Uh, the sure. way it's done. And I'll also, when I get them in there, I'll kind of remember how the other guys did it. And then when they get in there, I'll be like, um, you know, try, try doing it. You know, maybe you're a little bit more annoyed or maybe you're a little, a little more upset or something like that. Um, but yeah, so, when, when I first record them, we take it a page or two at a time, usually two pages at a time. And I just kind of let them do their thing. And then after we do one take, 
if they need a note, I might be like, okay, you know, try it this way. Try saying, you know, put an accent on this word instead of this word and just, just to change up the feel of it. And that just gives me options with editing. A lot of times I'll go back and use what their first take was, but just to have an option, I kind of get them to say things different ways. Sure. Um, and that, that helps out a lot. A lot of times the first take is usually the keeper, but I'm like, eh, let's, let's do one more for safety. Uh, just like you do with film. It's like, okay, exactly. that would be great, but uh, <laughs> I just want one more just in case there's something I'm missing here. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, make sure we've covered all the bases on, on this podcast outside of the, the final question, which is where can people listen to this? Well, you can get on any podcast player, and if you search for Gather by the Ghost Light, um, you, it should pop right up. Or at www.gatherbythegostlight.com, that's kind of the main page where you can listen to everything there as well. But that involves going to a website where a lot of people that listen to podcasts, they just you know get on their podcast player like Spotify or sure. Apple and can just look it up that way. So what platform do you use to upload then on that note? My podcast server is Podbean. Okay. How do you like it? I like it. Um, you know, they do have a, a small annual fee, but the stats that they provide, um, which I, at first I was hesitant because I'm like, ah, it's, I, I was just getting started. I was like, you know what? I might want to go with the free thing. Let me look at Anchor. Let me look sure. at this. Um, but then just uh, talking with other friends that have tried the podcast thing, they're like, yeah, but, you know, if you – try this service you know because if you ever do bring in ads or if you ever do this or that it'll already be all set up for you and you could just and so i started doing that and i really liked the experience because like i said i love seeing the stats i love see where to see where people are listening from sure um, seeing the different countries <laughs> that are hearing you know the plays that i'm putting out um it's been uh a crazy wild ride. I never would have thought that it would have built up <laughs> as much momentum as it has. Um, and, and getting the other playwrights involved, I think really boosted that. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, like I said, at first it was just, I, I was mainly focusing on my own stuff, but then once I started introducing other playwrights, you know, they spread the word and then the other voice actors I get in, they spread the word and it just, it kind of stacks up and um, the playwriting community, we all support each other. Um, there's not much drama that goes on, uh, but sure. you know, we, and so we all like listening to each other's stuff. If, if, uh, I don't know if you know, playwright John, maybe, but, um, he's got a play being produced in Atlanta, which is only two hours away from me this weekend. So I'm going to go check it out. Even though I've never met him in person, I've produced two of his plays nice. in the podcast, nice. uh, but he's, gonna be, he, he lives in Atlanta. So I get to meet him this weekend and see his nice. new play. So yeah, it's a nice little, um, the playwright community is great. I, I love all the new playwrights I've met and everyone is just nice. so uh, supportive. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, there's a potential that this may spark a flame. Um, are you opposed for, to people, for, uh, to people submitting their work to you for this or, or are you just not open to that right now? Cause I don't, I'm not, I'm not opposed. Actually, okay. right. uh, Earlier this year, only in the emailing group, the playwriting binge that I'm a part of, I did put out a submission call just for this emailing group. Um, and I received a, a good bit and I read every single one of them. Um, From beginning to end, no matter how good or bad? No matter how good or bad. I, I, yeah, to hear that. I took the time to read each good. one. Um, but like you said, I mean, some are definitely way better than others. Um, sure. And some of them are great on the page, but then when you think about it being an audio play, it just, it's, there's something, when I read a play, it's like I have to actually be able to hear it. And sure. the plays that have room for sound effects and room for music and action, those are the ones that I tend to produce more just because they so, work better in audio plays. So that was one of the other questions. And thank you for, for kind of, touching on that because now i have to ask you don't you don't add any you're doing a play as if all the lights were off on stage so you're not there's no narration mm -mm. there you're only adding sound effects if somebody like maybe is walking across the stage maybe somebody picks up a glass clankety clank clank maybe somebody sips you know you're adding stuff like that 
but there's no narration that helps guide any particular action to kind of move the story forward. No, this is uh, whatever the playwright wrote on the page. I try to preserve that. Now, okay. there, with every play that I've gotten so far, there's usually at least one or two visual cues that I tell them, I was like, we got to clean this up. Like if a character is just like, oh, would you hand me that? Or, hey, what's that? Or you sure. have to explain what they're talking about. So right. instead of hand me that, it's got to be hand me that umbrella, just so the audience knows what they're getting. Sure. You know? Just just little things like that, cleaning up visual okay. cues. Right. Um, but yeah, I will say science fiction and horror plays tend to be the best audio plays just because those plays tend to just have a lot of sound effects involved and stuff. Um, and then there have been some plays that have just been mainly dialogue, not much, not much effects at all. But those plays, when I read them, the dialogue is engaging enough that I'm okay with not having to layer on a bunch of effects and make get this immersive atmosphere uh, because what the playwright wrote is worth listening to. Right. Okay. Um, are you working on anything in particular right now yourself as a playwright? Um, I do have uh, actually the play that got semifinalist in uh, Stagecraft. The local theater, Le Chat Noir, is going to be, be performing it in uh, the premiere actually in November. Um, nice. It's a play with a, it has a military backdrop, and they're going to be opening night. It's going to be Veterans Day, so it's going to work out really nice. nice. Um, and then I'm also currently adapting one of my short plays to a full length, uh, and I'm still working on that, I'm probably about halfway through. So hopefully, which I'm really excited about that one more than anything else I've written. <laughs> Nice. Um, since we did talk about the ScreenCraft uh, stage play um, contest, um, before we wrap this up and I ask you a final question, what is the Porter Fleming Literary Award? Obviously, they have a playwriting um, section. Or yeah, That is a um, – It's the Porter Fleming Literary Award is uh, it's, it's a contest for southeastern states. I believe it's Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Florida. Just if you live in the Southeast, I forget the specific states it reaches out to, but it's basically a writing competition and they have different categories. It could be short stories, poems, um, playwriting. And uh, several years I've submitted to the playwriting category uh, and I've, I've placed third quite a bunch. I've placed second once. And then this year, I finally, after years of submitting, I finally got first place in that, which was congrats, exciting. <laughs> yes, awesome. Um, what do they? What what's the um, what's the award for that? What do you what do you get? Oh, um, first place was a thousand dollars, which oh. is so that that play has made me more money than any other play so far. <laughs> Would you rather have a thousand dollars or a four week production? Um, for a short play. I don't know. <laughs> I think for a full length play, I'd probably take the productions, but sure. like a, a short play, I'm I, I, cause I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I probably would, uh, would think on that. <laughs> sure. No, no, there's no, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Uh, just, again, go, going back to subjective. Um, where can people find your work? I'm on the new play exchange, uh, Jonathan okay. cook. And my website is Jonathan which has, Pretty much everything I do, uh, podcast info, playwriting, short film stuff. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the site of me where you can okay. pretty much see all my creative and they, endeavors. And they can contact you there as well if they wanted to submit one of those plays for... Uh, yeah, Gather the, by the for Gather by the Ghostlight, um, if you send a play to gatherbytheghostlight at gmail.com, that's, that's the best way to submit that, yeah. Wonderful. All right. Uh, all of these things will be in the show notes just in case. So uh, we won't have to worry about making sure that Jonathan is spelled right or cook or R for that matter. So Jonathan, thank you for coming out of the playwright spotlight. It was a pleasure meeting with you and uh, chatting. And this is a very, very insightful and a, a lot of great information. I'm glad that you can come on. All right. Thank you, sir. 
Thanks for tuning into this episode of Playwright Spotlight. Again, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below. Who's your favorite playwright? Who's your inspiration? What's your favorite play? Also, just say hi and let us know that you've been listening. Also, share this uh, video with a friend who's a playwright or an actor or director who thinks they might uh, you might think could benefit from this. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, be sure to subscribe to the channel and leave a five-star review. And in the meantime, and until we see each other again, keep writing. <laughs>